statistics, everybody's like least favorite topic in maths, right? But it becomes a lot cooler when instead of thinking about like the probability of heads or tails when you're flipping coins, compared to if you're trying to calculate the probability that two stars will collide when galaxies collide. So galaxy collisions or a galaxy merger aren't really rare occurrences at all. We see them sort of wherever we look in the universe. In fact, we think that most galaxies will undergo a merger with another galaxy at some point in its lifetime. And those might be piddly things, which we call like a minor merger, where you've got something that's a mass ratio of one to 10, i.e. like the other galaxy that's merging with your big galaxy is like 10th the size. And then sometimes you have something that we call a major merger, where two galaxies of roughly the same size, mass, number of stars will come together and merge, and the gravitational forces in those mergers are ridiculous. Galaxies literally get torn apart, and they get taken from these beautiful spiral structures, basically to looking like blobs. So take the Milky Way for example. The Milky Way has this huge stream of stars that we call the Sagittarius A stream. There's basically one of these little minor mergers with another galaxy that's basically been torn apart by gravity as it's got too close to the Milky Way, and now it's this collection of stars orbiting around us that will one day merge with the Milky Way. Now the Milky Way probably won't notice that because it's just a piddly collection of stars. However, also, in our sort of local group of galaxies, there's Andromeda Galaxy. Andromeda is one of the galaxies that is actually not moving away from us in the sky. Andromeda is actually coming towards us. It has what we call a blue shift. So in fact, Andromeda is actually going to merge with the Milky Way in the next two billion years or so. And that's going to create what people like to refer to as Milkameda, sort of the eventual product of what will happen when Andromeda comes and merges with the Milky Way to make one giant galaxy. So mergers are something we have to understand to be able to understand not just what's gonna happen to the Milky Way and the stars within the Milky Way and therefore the sun, because the sun is a star in the Milky Way, but also if we wanna understand how galaxies have evolved from, you know, straight after the Big Bang when they first form to how they look like now if, it, if mergers are a common occurrence. So to understand mergers, the first thing you can do is to try and simulate them on a computer and just sort of plug in all of the known laws of physics and just set two galaxies, two big collections of stars going towards each other and, and see what happens and see what you get. So when you make a simulation, you get like a video of, of what's actually happening, you know, over time in the merger. And what you can do is then compare that to what you see in the universe, because when you actually observe these mergers in the universe, they are just snapshots of what's going on at any different stage in the merger. And so you can sort of piece together where you see different mergers in different areas of the universe, like almost like a storyboard of what's going to happen. And so that's an iterative process because we'll see stuff in the universe that we then say, oh, we didn't make that in the simulations, we'll have to feed that back in. Or we'll see something in the simulations and say, well, do we see that in the universe? And is that a real thing? And we'll go hunting for it. And so there's a lot of feedback into the two things that help us better understand this process. So the question is whether two stars would ever collide when galaxies collide. So if we think about the numbers involved in like say the Milky Way and Andromeda colliding, the Milky Way has like 400 billion stars at most and then we think Andromeda has like a trillion. So you'd think with so many stars that the probability of actually two of those colliding would be very very high but that's not necessarily the case. If you think about the space between the sun and its nearest star, its nearest neighbor is Proxima Centauri, which is like four and a half light years or so away. So the ratio between the size of the sun and then like the distance to the nearest star is 0 0.0000002%. right? It's really, really small. So there is a lot of space between the stars, which means there's a lot of space for other stars coming in in that collision. And so because the galaxy is so empty, you can end up with really quite low probabilities for actually a collision happening, even in systems of trillions of stars. So let's try and put a number on this problem, right? We're going to make a couple of sort of simplifying assumptions to do that, the first of which is sort of to discount gravity. So you could have something that might not be on a direct collision with the sun, it might end up just sort of slingshotting around it instead. So we're going to assume instead to have a collision, you're going to have to be on like a direct trajectory uh, to actually collide with the sun. 
And then also I'm going to assume that basically the stars are evenly distributed around Andromeda in the Milky Way as well. Which is not really the case because it will be denser in the center and obviously you've got the denser collection of spiral arms as well. But as a simplifying assumption, it's a pretty decent one. So let's run with it. Then what we can imagine is that basically the stars are like particles in this system that you have. And we've known for a long time how to model how particles behave. In fact, it actually boils down to like a chemistry 101 problem, like particles of gas trapped in a box, say hydrogen atoms or helium atoms that might collide in some volume of box that you have. Instead, we've got star particles, which admittedly are made of hydrogen and helium, and they're trapped in the box of the Milky Way or the box of Andromeda. Well, we're actually going to do uh, some maths now. So in this problem of the sun moving through this sort of box of star particles, right, the sun is going to trace a cylinder basically through those particles as it moves, right? So if you have this sort of what you can assume is a box of particles, the sun is just one particle and it's going to be moving through that box at some speed v and it's going to take it a time of t to get across the box, okay? You're then going to have other particles in the box, all of which it could hit, but actually it's probably going to miss most of them because it's mostly empty space, right? Now what you have to work out is that as the sun travels at this speed v, which of those is it going to hit? So you have to say, well, perhaps only those that directly hit into the sun will hit it. But actually, if you make the assumption that your other stars in the box are about the same size as the sun, again, the sun's not that big, it's not that small, it's kind of in the middle and it's an average. So it's a fair assumption to take that all of the stars will be about the same size as the sun. And then you've got to think what happens when the sun meets another particle that's the same size of it, right? They could come with a direct collision, and so you could count the cylinder as just the size of the sun as it travels through. But you could also say that, well, what if they come just slightly above it and you get this glancing collision? You have to count that as a collision of two stars as well. So actually, this sort of cylinder that you're going to have collisions in is actually twice the size of the sun. So it's going to be two times the sun's radius. So the number of collisions you actually have, we're going to call that z, is going to be proportional to the size of this sun's cylinder. So this is just the area of a circle. So we've got an area of a circle two times the radius of the sun. So we've got pi r squared, but it's two radius of sun squared. And then that's times basically by the length of this cylinder that the sun traces out. And so the length of the cylinder is its velocity times by the time it takes, right? But you've also got to think about the number density of particles in this box as well. So all of these ones, it will miss, but maybe there's one here that it might hit, okay? And so that's going to also depend on the number density. So that's going to be the number of particles, say in Andromeda, divided by the volume of Andromeda. And again, Andromeda, if we think about it as just a disk of a galaxy, that's going to be a cylinder with some radius times by some height again. So that's nice and easy. And we know the number of stars in Andromeda. We know that's about a trillion. And we know the radius and the height of Andromeda. And we know the radius of the sun. And we've measured the speed that the sun goes round the galaxy as well. This T though, I'm going to assume that's sort of the time scale for a merger. So let's say that's, it tends to be between sort of like a billion to two billion years. So let's say it's a billion for a nice round number. So if we plug all those numbers in, you end up finding that you get 1.1 times 10 to the minus nine collisions in one gig year, in a billion years. So that's just the number of collisions you have. If you actually want a probability, you have to think about how many collisions you could have. So for example, if you roll a dice and you get a one, well, you could have got a one or two or three or four or five or a six. So you know that the probability of getting a one is one sixth. So you've got the number of collisions that occurs, but the number of possible collisions was a trillion, right? So if you actually want to calculate the probability, then you need to do the probability is the z over the number of collisions, which is just again the number of stars in Andromeda. And so your probability is actually 1.1 times 10 to the minus 21. Or if you want a percentage, it's 1.1 times 10 to the minus 19 percent. This 10 to the minus 19 means that you've got naught points and then 18 zeros and then a 1.
So the probability of the Sun colliding with any one of the trillion stars in Andromeda Galaxy is about a one in a sextillion chance. It's an incredibly, incredibly small number. What this number gives us is the probability that one star in the Milky Way will hit any of the trillion in Andromeda. You can then do one minus that number to find out the probability that the one star in the Milky Way misses all trillion stars in Andromeda. So what you have there is like this binary assumption, right? You either have hit or miss. You have two options. So two options is a really nice thing in stats because it means that you can use a really nice expression to describe what probability you have for any of those two options, hit or miss, or yes or no, or heads or tails, from happening any number of times. So we can use something called the binomial expression. And you may have come across this at school because yeah, you did use it for flipping heads and tails and finding out well, if the probability of getting a head is 0.4, then what's the probability of getting like 4,000 heads in 8,000 tosses. We can use the exact same maths for saying, instead of what's the probability for one star to hit any of a trillion stars, what's the probability when you've got 400 billion stars hitting into any a trillion stars? So if you plug all those numbers in, the probability that you get one collision out of like 400 billion possible tries is 0.0000, no, 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 and another not, four percent. That is less than one in a billion chance that any of the stars in the Milky Way collides with any of the stars in Andromeda. You can even use the same expression to find what would be the chance of two collisions occurring in a merger between Andromeda and the Milky Way, and that's even smaller. That's less in a quintillion chance of having those two collisions occur. So they're incredibly small numbers, all because there's just so much space between the stars in galaxies. Now those numbers might get bigger if you take into account that it's denser in the centre and that it's slightly different shape in the centre and also that the stars aren't always the size of the sun and that you've got gravity in there as well. But all of those effects are not going to be big enough in order to overcome the fact that you just have so much space between the stars in the system. And so that's the reason why the probability is so low for two stars to collide when two galaxies collide. When we actually observe them in the universe, what we're doing is just taking like a snapshot. A snapshot? <laughs> Did I just... I can... Okay. When you actually observe a merger in the universe, you, you just see a snapshot. Snapshot! Oh my god! <laughs> and so when you observe the universe, these become a snapshot. Uh, Done it again. So when you observe the universe itself, though, you essentially get what is a snapshot. <sighs> Jesus Christ, I'm frustrated. I just want to put like really dramatic music over all of these like videos of simulations of galaxies merging, like the Game of Thrones theme tune or something, but copyright won't let me. So I guess we just have to imagine it ourselves like